continue. Um, so to summarize what we've uh, learned in the previous hour, we've defined uh, Hunkel interprets operators. So the, the most important for us will be the commutation relations that they satisfy, namely interprets operators are exactly those guys, those bounded operators on the Hardy class that satisfy this. And the Hunker operators are those guys that satisfy this recurrence relation, this uh, commutation relation. And our aim is to describe eigenspaces of Toplitz operators and Schmidt subspaces of Hunker operators. So uh, hopefully towards the end, I will be able to motivate it eigenspaces for one and Schmidt subspaces for the other one and so on. Okay, but before we come to this, now I will have to uh, change the topic slightly and I will, uh, I will be speaking for the next hour about uh, the structure of certain class of subspaces in the Hardy space. Uh, and so for this, let me start by talking about inner functions. So I'll go to the next page and uh, my next topic is inner functions. Okay. Um, So first of all, some, some motivation. So uh, um, suppose we are trying to understand what are the invariant subspaces invariant subspaces of the shift operator. Um, in principle, we could ask this question uh, for the shift operator in uh, little l2, but it turns out that uh, the answer, the most satisfactory answer is given uh, if we look at this, uh, the shift operator as a shift operator in the Hardy class. So uh, let's try to understand this. So, um, so okay, so we are looking for closed linear subspaces. such that S maps M into M. So uh, the first hint at what uh, these things could be is uh, uh, the following example. Let's consider an example. Um, so uh, suppose we have, um, that we, we've selected finitely many points Let's say um, Z1, etc., Zn inside the unit disk. And suppose our subspace is the set of those F in the Hardy class that vanish at these points. Okay. So by the way, uh, just to say that uh, uh, um, here we are, I'm talking about the description of a Hardy class as a Hardy class inside the unit disk. And remember that uh, we can express f of z1, for example, as an inner product of f with a special element, what I think I denoted it by u, right, by u z1. This is the what we call the reproducing kernel. This is a bounded element in, so u, sorry, u, uz1 of z is one minus z1 bar z. So this is a bounded, uh, uh, it's an element in our h2. And so because, uh, because, 
this functional is written such an inner product. This is a bounded linear functional on H2. And so this, what we get, this is a, a closed subspace in H2. Now it's clear that uh, if a function has zeros somewhere, I multiply it by Z, it will still be having zeros there, right? Multiplication by Z will not change this. And so this subspace, uh, this subspace will of course be invariant. So this is our, uh, uh, an important example of an invariant subspace for Z, for, for the shift operator for S. So it turns out that essentially all invariant subspaces of the shift operator look like this, or more properly, you have to take a certain generalization of this. So instead of finitely many points, you have to take uh, infinitely many points satisfying certain conditions. Uh, and uh, you also have to allow uh, certain singularities at the unit circle, which are not so easy to describe by looking at this example. But nevertheless, essentially Berling's theorem that I will uh, discuss um, in a few minutes tells us that these are, that all subspaces, all invariant subspaces of the shift operator uh, look uh, as generalization of this example. So this is the motivation for introducing inner functions. So uh, inner function uh, it will be a function that allows us to factor out uh, zeros of any given function in H2, uh, uh, any, any zeros um, on the, in the unit disk. So let me proceed with the definitions. Okay, so uh, definition. Um, so theta in H infinity, remember that H infinity is a bounded analytic function in the unit disk. This is called inner. Inner. If its absolute value equals to one almost everywhere on the unit circle. So once again, here I'm in the same sentence, I'm kind of mixing two different notions. Okay, initially I said two, two different views on the uh, Hardy class. Uh, first I started by saying theta is analytic function in the unit disk, but then I was talking about its values on the unit circle. So it's important uh, to understand that any function analytic uh, in the uh, unit disk, uh, which belongs to H2 has boundary values uh, almost everywhere on the unit circle. So in this case, we take these boundary values and we require that these boundary values must be equal to one in the absolute value almost everywhere. Uh, now let's look at some examples. So the first example, uh, as just as on the left half of the slide, we take these points at one, Zn in D, and we define theta of Z as a product of this form. Okay, so here Z is inside the unit disk. So then this theta is inner. So what do we have to do? To check that it's inner, you have to take an absolute value of each term and check that it's one on the uh, unit disk. Uh, that's a very simple exercise. You do it <coughs> for each of these, you know, for each of these factors. And uh, so this product is called the Blaschke product. Blaschke product of degree n. Okay, so obviously this function has zeros precisely at this point Zn because of the numerator. And uh, the role of the denominator is just to make sure that the absolute value of this thing is one uh, on the unit circle. Okay, 
Now, uh, this example can be modified to include infinitely many, um, infinitely many uh, zeros. So uh, let me, uh, maybe I'll move on to the next page. So the next example, So suppose now we have an infinite sequence. Uh, in the unit disk and we want to define an analog of the infinite product as before. So there are two issues. There is an issue of convergence basically, right? So we have to ensure that this product converges. So this necessitates, first of all, one condition on these Zn's. So this sum must define it and this is called the Blaschke condition. And secondly, uh, in our product, so let me write it down, in our product, we must insert some unimodular complex factors to make sure that it converges. So on the previous page, we didn't have these uh, unimodular factors here because the convergence was not an issue. So here, uh, uh, with these unimodular constant factors, uh, the, this, uh, this product will actually converge under this condition. Okay, so again, uh, this is an inner function. Uh, its absolute value on the unit circle is one. It has zeros precisely at these points Zn. So this is an infinite Blaschke product. And we define its degree to be infinity. So the degree of theta will be infinity. Okay, uh, next example. Next example. So um, suppose we have a measure, let's call it mu, it's no negative finite, singular, measure on the unit circle. So singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So it may be um, um, atomic or maybe singular continuous. So then we define an inner function like this. This is called the singular inner function. Okay, so this is a singular inner function corresponding to mu. So for example, if our mu has only mass at the point one, and uh, equal, the mass equals to C, then this inner function will be this, uh, yeah, this inner function will have this exact formula here. So this inner function um, is uh, bounded on the unit circle, on the unit disk, and has absolute values uh, of the absolute value one on the boundary. Um, so just one little remark or uh, warning. Warning. So if you take, uh, so the, here C is non-negative, uh, it's positive. If you take C negative, so if you consider, for example, something like this. Uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to write exponential, of course. It should be exponential, excuse me. So here should be exponential. So here, if you write, if you write something like this, if you write exponential of minus this with the wrong sign, 
this function is also has absolute values one almost everywhere on the unit disk but it's not bounded it has exponential growth growth inside the unit disk when you approach uh, the boundary and so this is not in there okay so it's important to bear in mind so the function has to have absolute values one and be bounded inside the unit disk by the maximum principle it will be bounded by one of course inside okay and so uh, essentially uh, these two examples exhaust all um, possibilities for inner functions so any inner function any inner function theta can be represented as some Blaschke product times some singular inner function so this is the Blaschke product and this is the what I call here this is the same as sing single inner function. Okay. So uh, now uh, having defined inner functions, now I can move to uh, the discussion of a uh, Berling's theorem. So this is exactly what I started my motivation from. So I, I remember that on the previous page I said, uh, what are the invariant subspaces of the uh, shift operator? So now I can dis describe them. I in terms of these inner functions. Okay, so this is our next topic, Berling's theorem. Okay, uh, so let me revisit my uh, first example from the previous page. But uh, let me um, so let theta be an inner function. We consider a subspace which is defined like this. So what is it? I take, so this is simply theta f for all f in H2. So I take any function in H2 and multiply it by, uh, by this theta. So notice that because theta has um, uh, absolute value one on the unit circle, it means that the multiplication by theta is an isometry is an isometry on H2. And so uh, what I have, of course, it's a closed subspace because it's an isometric image of the whole space. So uh, it's clear that if I, take, uh, if I take a function in this class, so I take theta f and multiply it by s, this will be, I can write it as theta times sf, so SF is uh, still in the Hardy class. And so what we get is that this M is invariant under the action of the shift operator. Now Berling's theorem tells us that this is the only example of uh, invariant subspaces for the shift. So let me state this. This is 1949. So let M in H2 be a closed subspace such that S, um, S maps M into M. And uh, let's assume that it's non-trivial. So M is non-zero and M is not the whole space. Then M is 
theta h2 for some inner function theta. Uh, by the way, I should say, I think, uh, so whether you take constant, whether you define constant, unimodular constant to be an inner function or not is a matter of agreement. Uh, most people say that constants are not inner functions. So inner functions should be non-constant by definition. And so then this is uh, in agreement with this formulation. Of course, uh, if you take theta to be constant, then M will be the whole of H2. So, uh, so here we will say that constant is not an inner function. Okay. So uh, that's uh, Berling's theorem. Um, any questions so far? So now let me move on and uh, let me discuss model spaces. So uh, now we want to discuss invariant subspaces, not of S, but of S star. So note the following general fact. This is just uh, uh, for any operator. So a subspace is invariant under some operator if and only if the orthogonal complement of this is invariant under the adjoint operator. So here I'm talking about any bounded operator in the Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, so this is a easy general fact. So then as a corollary of Berling's theorem, we obtain a characterization of all invariant subspaces for the backwards shift, for the S star. Corollary. So let again, let M be closed subspace. S star M, S star maps M to M, M is not zero and not the whole space. Then M can be written as H2 intersected with theta H2. Uh, orthogonal complement. So uh, this is, okay, so here uh, I could have written simply theta H2 orthogonal complement, but uh, this intersection with H2 is taken for clarity because when you take this orthogonal complement, you often think of being in uh, big L2, okay? Uh -huh. So you are in big L2, you take orthogonal complement, but then you have to restrict onto H2. So this is just for clarity. If, if your whole world is H2, then you don't need this first uh, factor, this first uh, term. Okay, so um, uh, there is a special notation, a special name for this space. Notation is K theta and the name is model space. Model space. So um, the name is motivated uh, by the following fact. Uh, so uh, the thing is that, um, so if you take your shift operator and restrict it onto K theta, remember that K theta is invariant under S star, right? So we can restrict it onto it. And so this serves as a model operator, model, operator for, let me say, some contractions. So contraction in the Hilbert space is just an operator whose norm is less than or equal to one. So um, 
okay, so if you are coming from, for example, spectral theory of Schrodinger operator or spectral theory of differential operators, typically operators are self-adjoint or unitary. Right, so this is one world. So another world, uh, where, so in the, in the self-adjoint and unitary world, you have functional model. And so it, it's, it's very easy to, to, to understand spectral theory of such operators. Now, uh, um, if you have non-self-adjoint operators, then typically, okay, if you're talking about bounded operators, then up to scaling, you can uh, assume that the norm of your operator is uh, less than or equal to one. Then you need some models for such operators. So it's very difficult to construct a model for all operators, for all contractions. It's basically an impossible problem or models that would be useful. But for some subclasses of contractions, you can do it. And this is one of them. Okay, so I will not go too deep into this, but uh, I will just, uh, this is just to explain why it is called a model space, because this is a concrete functional, <coughs> concrete functional model for a certain class of uh, operators. Okay, uh, and uh, the reason why I'm introducing these model spaces is because these model spaces will actually uh, be sort of building blocks in the description of eigenspaces and Schmidt subspaces of Turplitz and Hunkel operators. Okay, but for now, uh, uh, let me just uh, sort of give you a brief crash course on those uh, subspaces, on those model spaces. Just say uh, a few, uh, uh, mention a few facts about them. Okay, so let me go to the next page. Um, so, first of all, uh, let me write down the condition that F belongs to this model space in several equivalent ways. So what does it mean? Remember that F must be in H2 and F must be orthogonal to theta H2. Now, because multiplication by theta is isometry, I can multiply both sides by theta bar, right? So this is equivalent to saying the theta bar F is orthogonal to right, and so here orthogonality must be thought of as orthogonality in a big L two space because here the left hand side here this uh, theta bar F of course uh, doesn't have to be in H two it's an element in L two. Mm -hmm. Now if you have an element in L two which is orthogonal to H two, uh, then uh, it means that if you take a complex conjugation of this, this will be back in H2 up to the constant terms, right? So remember that if, if you take um, elements of H2, uh, so, okay, so um, uh, let, me, let me just write this down because if you are not used to this first time, it needs to be explained. So, so, so so if you take a complex conjugate of an element in H, then it will be here up to the constant element. So the con constant uh, n equals zero term. So coming back to my uh, description of uh, F being in K theta, we see that we can rewrite this as uh, taking complex conjugation and uh, uh, taking care of the constant element I can write it like this, zeta bar, theta f bar is in H2. Okay, so uh, that's an equivalent description. So I take my function f, which is was originally from the Hardy class. I take it, its boundary values on the unit circle, take a complex conjugation. Of course, this is no longer in the Hardy class, but then I multiply by theta, multiply by z bar and this turns out to be an H2. This is an equivalent description of my K theta class. So much of what, much of the analysis in Hardy class is about this kind of uh, algebra, right? You, you, you see what we are doing here, it's not really analysis, it's some algebra sort of pushing these theta symbols around, re rewriting some orthogonality relation and so on. This is sort of, I'm trying to give you the taste of these, uh, these things. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, consider a couple of examples of uh, uh, model spaces. 
so example one so here uh, assume that our inner function is just z to the power n okay so what is it what does it mean what is k theta so for uh, f is in k theta means f is orthogonal to z n h2 so if you think about it so what is z n h2 so z n h2 is the set of all such elements where the sum starts from capital n right so if my f is orthogonal to them it means that its coefficients go only from 0 to n minus 1 so uh, so uh, k theta is simply the set of all polynomials of uh, degree no more than uh, of degree less than or equal to n minus 1 okay where a naught etc a n minus 1 are complex numbers so it's just as simple as that uh, next example consider the finite Blaschke product so let uh, theta of z is the finite Blaschke product so uh, then in this case uh, what does it mean for f to be in have zeros precisely at these points uh, precisely at these points uh, uh, zn and so f being orthogonal so f being in okay so let me first type let, not with f but with some other guy g right so let's say g is in theta h2 means precisely that g u z n is zero for n from one to n remember that u z n these are the uh, reproducing kernels so if so g uh, th this in the product would be the value of g at z n and we require that this value is zero so look uh, so uh, the condition that g is in theta h2 means that g must be orthogonal to these uh, uh, reproducing kernel so that means conversely that if we go to the orthogonal complement of such g this is the span of those reproducing kernels okay so you can see that as a consequence this k theta is simply the linear span of those uh, use at n and from one to n i'm assuming that n are not repeated so if they are repeated you have to so, uh, so you can have a root of uh, multiplicity roots with multiplicities then you have to have derivatives of these reproducing kernels and so on so uh, but uh, the idea is exactly the same okay so uh, these are two sort of key examples of model spaces that help us to understand it so first of all a few kind of informal words so model spaces are uh, simple building blocks uh, uh, for any for, for for many kinds of theories in the hardy class so um, think of uh, some analogy in, in terms of uh, for example if you are describing uh, if, uh, if you're describing for example uh, uh, spectral theory of some differential operators you typically you need some subspaces in your l2 right so you need uh, uh, sobolev spaces or some uh, uh, smooth classes and so on so in the hardy class uh, if you want reasonable subspaces this is typically tends to be more algebraic description 
uh, because the condition of analyticity is very rigid. And so uh, these uh, model spaces are extremely useful tool. They come up in many, many uh, aspects of uh, uh, Hardy class theory and they're building blocks for many theories. So let me mention without much detail a few aspects uh, of this theory. So um, uh, first of all, um, theta vanishes at zero is the simplest case in some sense. Uh, and it's equivalent to one being in k theta, okay? So indeed, if, if one is in k theta, it means that one is orthogonal to all, all of theta h2. For example, one is orthogonal to theta. And remember, if somebody is orthogonal to one, that just means that this guy vanishes at zero. Okay, this is just an explanation for this. Um, second point, this map uh, that we saw uh, here, so this map, the map from, from F to Z bar theta F bar is an involution involution on k theta. So in fact, not only uh, this guy is in H2, you can check by performing sort of simple algebra along these lines that it's also in k theta. It's also orthogonal to uh, theta H2. Well, this is almost obvious, right? Because to write that this guy is orthogonal to theta H2, is the same as to write that Z bar F bar is orthogonal to H2, which is true. So it turns out that this is an involution. So if you apply it twice, you get back to the same element. And it plays a big role in uh, the theory of these uh, model spaces. Next, uh, so these, um, the geometry of model spaces is intimately related to the arithmetic of the inner functions. It, it mirrors this arithmetic. So let me uh, write this down more exactly. So more precisely, what does it mean? So oh, the, we have this inclusion for two model spaces, if and only if uh, theta one divides theta two. So this is this notation is from um, I don't know, number theory or elementary arithmetic divides, but what does it mean? So theta one divides theta two means that uh, theta two is theta one times phi, and phi is another inner function. Okay, so uh, you see uh, these inclusions mirror the arithmetic of inner functions. You can do the same thing with, uh, uh, for example, intersections of model spaces. An intersection of a model space is a model space uh, which uh, corresponds to the, uh, let me see, the, uh, the least common multiple of these two, theta one and theta two. And the span corresponds to the, the span of the two corresponds to the, uh, to the, no, the greatest common divisor, I think. Okay, so it's the arithmetic mirrors. Uh, you're right, yeah, ex ex exactly. The, 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 the intersection, the intersection, the, the intersection corresponds to Yes, you're right, the intersection corresponds to the common divisor and the span corresponds to the least common multiple. Thank you. So, uh, uh, yes. So, uh, have I answered your question, Tanya? Yes, yes. Yes, мне просто кажется, что тут надо в формуле написать наоборот. Тета 1 равно тета 2 умножить на фи, нет? 
Если тета-1 делится на тета-2. Тета-1 делит, не делится, а делит. А, делит, все, спасибо. Ага, ага. ага, ага делит. Окей. Okay. Окей. Right. So... Okay. Um, and final, final point is that uh, suppose for simplicity that um, uh, theta is a finite Blaschke product. So then the spectrum of, of, uh, sorry, of the backwards shift restricted onto k theta is precisely the set of zeros of theta. So theta, the analytic properties of theta encode spectral properties of this backwards shift operator restricted onto k theta. So this is why they're also important because there is, there is also a rich interplay between function theory of these in the functions and uh, the geometry of subspaces in each to the, the spectral theory of uh, 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 backward shift. Okay. So now I think the introductory part is kind of coming to an end and we are coming, uh, diving deeper into the theory of those uh, inner uh, model spaces. So uh, our next uh, topic is uh, isometric multipliers on model spaces. So if most of the previous uh, parts were known by 1950s at least, uh, this is a topic which uh, originated in uh, late 1980s, mainly due to the work of Saracen and his uh, and people around him. Okay, so let me first give a definition. So uh, suppose M is a closed subspace in the Hardy class. And let P be just an analytic function in the unit disk. It doesn't have to be a priori, it doesn't have to be uh, in any function space. So then we will say that P is an isometric multiplier isometric multiplier uh, on M if for any F in M the product P times F. So here, this is the product uh, which is taken just as a product of two analytic functions inside the unit disk. So if this product turns out to be an H2 and the multiplication acts as an isometry. Okay. One simple remark. that if our space M contains the element one, then if we take uh, for F here, this element one, then we see that P automatically must be an H2 and its norm must be the same as the norm of one that is one, okay? So then in this case, luckily P is actually an H2 and its norm is one. So in most cases, you uh, at least for for model spaces, as we will see soon, uh, isometric multipliers are always in H2. Okay, so uh, if we have an isometric multiplier, 
uh, on a space M, then we will write PM for the image of this multiplier. So that is simply the set of PF, where F is in M. So now actually we have everything in order to give you a glimpse of uh, what is uh, of uh, the two main results that I'm going to prove in this mini course. So it turns out that uh, the all that all eigenspaces of Toeplitz operators have the form p uh, have the form p times model space. And the same is true for all Schmidt subspaces of Hanker operators. So this is why we are looking at these subspaces, at these uh, model spaces and isometric multipliers. So uh, before coming to this, to these results, let me uh, just uh, discuss in a little more detail this topic of isometric multipliers. So, um, So, uh, okay, so now let me talk a little bit about uh, Saracen's theorem. Uh, so, uh, Saracen in 88, I think, described all isometric multipliers on k theta, on model spaces. So to give this description, let me just uh, mention the following simple fact. Fact that if you have a function g in the Hardy space of norm one, uh, then there exists a b in h infinity such that g can be represented in this form for z in the unit disk and moreover it's important you have this relation almost everywhere on the unit circle. So uh, it's not a very difficult fact, uh, uh, but it's quite useful. So here, this is some sort of useful parameterization of all uh, functions in the, uh, of, of unit norm. This is not unique, you can see that these A and B are not unique, but they do exist. Okay, so what did Saracen, what was Saracen's description of uh, isometric multipliers on K theta? So, a theorem. Saracen, 88. Uh, so, let theta be in a function and let's assume that theta of zero is zero. Uh, then P is an isometric multiplier on K theta if and only if there exist A and B in H infinity, sum squared equals to one almost everywhere on the unit circle such that this P can be represented in this form. Um, Am I writing it? Yes. Like this. Okay, so in other words, the, if you look at, okay, so let, the, the logic is as follows. 
so suppose we uh, we have some uh, p, and we try we are trying to understand whether it's an isometric multiply on k theta, where theta is an inner function with theta of zero equals zero. Now by this remark we know that p should better have norm one, right? Because otherwise it has no chance, right? Because we know we know that theta of zero equals zero means that our k theta contains the element one, and so this p must be of norm one. Now, according to this fact, we can represent this g in this form. So Saracen says that uh, this p will be a multiplier if and only if the denominator part b is divisible by theta, right? Theta divides the denominator. That's, uh, that is Saracen's result. So uh, what I want to do in uh, the remaining of this uh, hour, I want to prove uh, the easy part, sort of the, the easy part of the easy case of this theorem, <laughs> okay? So the full theorem is completely beyond the scope of, uh, of this. It's, uh, uh, the proof is not so simple, uh, but uh, I just want to look at one particular argument that, uh, that we can do here, okay? So uh, let me move to the next page. Okay. So uh, let me just call this uh, some ideas of proof. So what I will prove is the following. I will assume uh, that P is represented, as I said, so I've got A of Z one minus theta of Z V of Z. And I will prove that this P must be an isometric multiplier on K theta. So the proof depends on some very nice algebra. So I write P absolute value squared as follows on the unit circle, okay? So this is one minus theta B squared on the unit circle. Remember that uh, we have this relation on the unit circle. And so I write the numerator as one minus B squared. Now, this is the following thing. Let me just write this down and then I will uh, explain. So this is just algebra with complex numbers, nothing else. Okay, so if I just put these fractions under the common denominator. Uh, downstairs, of course, I have mod modulus of one minus theta b squared. And upstairs, you know, if you tidy everything up, you will see that because theta is unimodular, uh, some terms will cancel and uh, I will get just one minus uh, b squared. So it's the same thing. Okay, now the trick is as follows. Let's multiply both sides of this equation by mod f squared and uh, make some rearrangements. So let me do this. So I've got P squared squared equals squared plus, and now the second term, I will write it as follows. B F over one minus theta B. And here I have theta F bar. And uh, similarly, the next one, I've got B bar F bar, one minus theta bar B bar, here theta bar F. So why did I write it in such a strange form? Let's look at it. So let's look at this term. So, uh, so I have, I write it as a, uh, I, I, oh, I, I, I look at it as a product of two terms. 
this one and this one. So this one, the first one is clearly in H2, all right? Oh yeah, uh, uh, sorry, one, one important, one important uh, assumption uh, is that I will assume that B is uh, strictly is bounded away from one. Because there is a problem if B approaches one, then the denominator may uh, be zero and I don't want this problem, okay? So I will assume that B is uh, uh, bounded away from one. So in this case, the, the denominator is very nice. The denominator is bounded away from zero. The numerator is uh, something in H2. So certainly the, the whole thing is in H2. Now, look at the second bit, right? Look at theta uh, f bar. So remember that, yeah, theta, now what is theta? Theta is an element in the model space. And remember that this means precisely that z bar theta f bar is in H2. Equivalently, theta f bar is in z h2 okay and so the second term here is in z h2 okay so that means that this whole first term this whole first term will be in z h1 so, well, like in L2, the product of two L2 functions is an L1 function. Similarly, there are Hardy spaces with exponents other than two. So here I'm operating with Hardy class H1. So uh, the important part is that now, now let's integrate, let's integrate this guy uh, over the unit circle. So when we integrate, the important part is that um, the integral of this guy will be zero because uh, its Taylor expansion starts from Z, right? It's Z H1. So the constant term is zero. So now, so the same applies to the second guy. The second guy, this guy is just the complex conjugate of this red guy. So if I integrate it, I also get zero. So all in all, when I integrate the two sides of this expression over the unit circle, I get the following. In the right hand side, the only term that remains is this one. And so this, so this is the integral over the unit circle and that is precisely the condition of isometricity. That precisely means that PF norm is the same as the norm of f. And so p is indeed an isometric multiplier on k theta. Okay, so uh, this is a rather simple argument. It gives you maybe a flavor of some of the um, arguments in this theory. Most of all, it's just sort of algebra, but uh, sometimes you have to do a little analysis as well. Okay, so I think uh, my time is up for today and uh, so the plan for Thursday is as I said to prove that um, uh, all these eigenspaces and Schmidt subspaces that I was talking uh, in the beginning they're all of the form p k theta where p is an isometric multiplier on k theta that's the plan okay uh, and that's that is, it. And, uh, and this is the main result, actually. Yes, right? that, that, yes that, that, that will be exactly the main result. Yes, the main result will be that uh, certain subspaces uh, have this structure, PK theta, exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. So you see, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the aim of this course is to show you a small cross-section of uh, modern uh, theory of Hardy class, of, of, of operators on the Hardy class, uh, by looking by focusing specifically on uh, on this theorem. So if you want some analogs of to analogs uh, to with the, in the theory of differential operators, for example, you can ask what is the structure of 
an arbitrary subspace, an arbitrary eigenspace of, uh, I don't know, Schrodinger operator. So it's hard to describe, but we know a few things about it. It's better be, uh, it's better con consist of uh, smooth functions, for example, right? Because uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a solution to an elliptic differential equation and so on, right? You have, you have some description of it as of a most general subspace. So here, this is the same story. You're asking about the description of some uh, subspaces that appear as eigenspaces in the analysis of some very fundamental operators and acting in the Hardy class. And so this is a structural yeah. description of this subspace. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sasha, I, I have uh, get several uh, uh, letters from colleagues uh, who are asking to look at, at the recording of, the, of, of, of your lecture because they were awesome. giving their lectures, uh, uh, students were uh, following some lecture courses during this time. And is it possible to put the recordings on the uh, absolutely you have my permission absolutely yes okay yes. thank you thank you very yes, much yes yes so what i will do i uh, you know uh, when i was uh, preparing these lectures yes. i was uh, going to follow some plan uh, which uh, so i i gave a version of this mini course in barcelona last year but uh, when i was preparing this i i uh, decided to to change a little and uh, give it more broader, uh, not just focusing on Hanker operators, but talking about tuplets as well and giving a broader picture. So the lecture notes that I originally sent to you, I think I will revise them substantially after, uh, after I'm finished with the lectures to make more in line with what I'm talking about. And then, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you can also put them somewhere in the public domain. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Tatiana. Спасибо. Thank you. Thank you. So, see you in two days. In two days on Thursday, the same format, yeah? Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Ask Akhil some other questions. Yeah, some questions, of questions. course. Questions are very welcome. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. No, it, it's nice. I, I, I think it's very nice. So the big, yeah, the first uh, quite hour, unusual, but very nice. Yeah, I'm I'm aware that this is you know for specialists in mathematical physics, this is a completely different territory. This is why I'm trying to go very slowly. My purpose is just to give you a taste of this. You see that it's a much more algebraic. Uh, science in, in nature. You see there are these constant algebras with inner functions and, and so on. As you see, analysis is kind of hidden. You know, it's hidden. Analytic, uh, analytic. Complex analysis. Complex right? analysis, that's right. That's nice, right. Yes. Nice complex analysis. Yeah? The thing is that, you know, uh, in, uh, for example, when you look at uh, spectral theory of differential operators, there is no structure of mm -hmm. multiplication, right? You cannot multiply solutions to um, elliptic uh, um, uh, differential equation, right? If you multiply, there will no longer be uh, uh, solutions. But analytic functions, you can multiply. <laughs> this is the key difference, right? So it gives you, uh, okay. it gives you additional algebraic flavor to, this, uh, to the whole story because you can, you can factorize mm -hmm. and, 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 and so on. So, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I personally quite like it. I mean, five years ago, I knew almost nothing of it, but uh, now I'm really big fan of this. This is very beautiful. Five years ago, five years, years ago. About five or seven years ago, yes. I, I started uh, working on Hanker. Hanker operators appeared in my work when I looked at um, the problem uh, of describing functions of self adjoint operators. And then, you know, I got more and more interested mm -hmm. in uh, spectral theory of Hanker operators, but Hanker operators naturally live in, on the Hardy class. So you cannot avoid it. You cannot avoid learning a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hardy class. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So now it became sort of, you know, my full-time job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you okay. Much. Okay. I'll see you okay. uh, next week. Yeah. Next week. Uh, next. Uh, well, next. Not next week. Next. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No. On Thursday. Not next week. On Thursday. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah, on bye. Thursday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. Bye, Sasha. Thank you. And bye. Mm -hmm.